Well, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has said three Ghanaians have been injured in the ongoing xenophobic attacks in South Africa. The three are currently receiving treatment. We understand a press statement uh, that was issued by the ministry on Friday, uh, September 6, 2019. Now, why are these xenophobic attacks becoming a regular feature in a country that some say knows too well about the price of freedom? Uh, what are the undercurrents and uh, really sure there wouldn't be another xenophobic attack again? Because it's not the first time this year that we're having to record this. We'll be talking about this on the show this morning. The Netherlands ambassador to Ghana has taxed the Ghana Integrity Initiative to pursue what he is termed a Ghana Beyond Corruption agenda. As government has officially launched its Ghana Beyond Aid policy. So he put the question, quote, your official policy is Ghana Beyond Aid. Why not Ghana Beyond Corruption? Sought to get a reaction from the senior minister, Yosef Omafo. We'll hear from him as we go on, on the show. He says that from what he does know, this man did not really say that. We'll play the video to you so we put the issues into perspective. There's a leaked report suggesting that government's 30-day probe into the PDS deal has been exonerated. As a matter of fact, PDS has been exonerated after this particular probe. But was, however, faulted for not having enough financial guarantees for the deal. The report of the Millennium Development Authority investigations, which they contracted FTI Consulting, a US-based firm, to do on their behalf, says it has not identified any information to suggest that either PDS, Cal Bank, Danwell, Shans, and or personnel from MIDA committed or conspired to commit fraud or other malfeasance in relation to the demand guarantees on the suspended PDS deal. But this has raised a lot more questions and concerns. I will settle for a conversation on this matter. My guests joined me this morning. And indeed, you should be concerned about everything we're going to be talking about this morning here. Reason? is that your views and your thoughts are always an integral part of this conversation. My name is Alfred Okansi, and this is Key Point. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. Do stay. Welcome back to Key Point here on TV3. Remember, we're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook and on DSTV channel 279, also on 3FM 92.7. And it's highly interactive. You want to share your thoughts with us on the issues we're going to be discussing this morning. My name is Alfred Okansi. I'm sitting in for your regular host. But let's start off this discussion this morning with uh, what's happening in South Africa. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is saying that three Ghanaians have been injured in the ongoing xenophobic attacks in South Africa. Uh, according to the statement, the three are currently receiving treatment and they say, as at September 6, 2019, uh, yesterday, five Ghanaians have been arrested for uh, their involvement in this particular riot as a result of the xenophobic attacks. Now, why are these xenophobic attacks happening or occurring regularly? And this is a source of worry. And we're going to be hearing from uh, a number of people who will play back a few of the conversations I've been having throughout the week. But I've been joined in studio by Nanato Dazi, his international political transition expert and executive coordinator of CDT Ghana and obviously a former chief of staff of the Republic of Ghana. Nana, thank you for your time. Good morning to you. Welcome. Dr. Vladimir Entry Danson is an international relations expert also joining me in studio. Oh, as always, it's great to have you. Thank Good morning you. to you. But I'm Joseph Nkroma, the chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, NCCE. She's been very hard over the period in the fight against corruption. Madam, thank you. It's good thank to have you. Good morning. You good morning. Let me start off with you, uh, as always, Dr. Vladimir Chinanso. Um, but before we get into your, your thoughts on what's been happening in South Africa over the period, I just want us to take a listen to what George Isubuatin, who is Ghana's High Commission, uh, Ghana's Ambassador to, uh, uh, I beg your pardon, Ghana's High Commissioner to South, South Africa. Uh, making that statement that no Ghanaian had been uh, killed or affected by this particular xenophobic attacks. Now, that was earlier in, in the week. 
What we do know now is that five Ghanaians um, have been injured in the ongoing xenophobic attacks. And so let's take a listen to him. We all know the happenings, the current happenings. Very disturbing, uh, very unfortunate attacks on uh, foreign nationals. Uh, very, very unfortunate. I call it very, very unfortunate. But I appeal to my fellow Ghanaians to monitor situations carefully. Those who live around prone violence areas must take caution. And then those um, uh, also living around hotspots, what I would describe as places I would describe as hotspots, must also take caution and monitor uh, movement of uh, most probably assailants. When there is any need for us to put in place contingency measures, I will describe, I will take it as contingency measures, assure, uh, be assured that they will do it. I have uh, capable, able members of staff who in all situations are ready to work. So if there should be any need of any contingency measure, I will put in place. Well, so that was uh, the Ghana's High Commissioner to South Africa, George Isu Barton, speaking earlier in the week. Now, uh, this obviously goes contrary to what we do know now, Dr. Vladimir Chidan. So, and you wouldn't blame him really because the, you, you, when, as a Ghanaian, when you get into another country, obviously it's your responsibility to make yourself known to the, uh, to the embassy or the High Commission there. Well, um, no one should blame the High Commissioner for making those remarks because um, in such a situation, things change fast. If we should ask him today, he might give us these figures, he might give us the, the situation report and things like that. But basically, xenophobia in South Africa is becoming a yearly ritual, one way or the other. We must understand that um, when an economy is having a downturn, citizens begin to blame the government and blame usually foreigners. You know, when an economy has a downturn, foreigners don't feel it much because they are ready to brace the storm, work harder than they were working, sure. and, and, and they are able to withstand whatever the problems that the downturn has given. Mm -hmm. However, citizens feel, they feel the pinch, and they see the foreigners uh, doing well, and uh, we've had it in several countries. Uh, Ghana, in the 70s, we asked Nigerians to go. No, of course, we're asking foreigners to go, but you know, Nigerians were affected. In 83, 84, you know, the same thing. I think the problem that Nana told us, and others may have had around that time, my uh, friend, late friend, Johnny Hansen and others, you know, when they tell you how we uh, suffered and how policy was a problem. So mm -hmm. it, it, it does happen in most countries. But with South Africa, the, the causal relationship between what is happening and what has been happening uh, cannot be, cannot be far fetched. I mean, the point is this that the move from apartheid to freedom has not resonated well. We saw that when they had their freedom, there was black on black violence, very serious violence. Mm. So the psyche about violence hasn't gone down. That's number one. Oh. And South Africa is noted to be <clears throat> the, having the highest rate of uh, crime mm -hmm. in the world, yes. more than the US, for example. Again, if you watch out, South African institutions have as yet not gotten the freedom that they need to mm -hmm. run South Africa as a democracy. Watch the police kill thousands, uh, hundreds of people in the, during the mine strike, for example. They yeah. were killed like, like you are aiming at the human being and killing. And that was what apartheid was doing. So I'm not surprised that these things are still prevalent. Then with the citizens, the psyche is that just fight, destroy. You know, mm. so when you put all these things together, you, you shouldn't be too much surprised when there are such kind of uh, uh, attacks on innocent persons, burning people in a despicable manner and that kind of thing. So we need to understand it from this perspective and find solutions to them. First, the South African government is the first uh, object, let's say. Mm. Is there a government in South Africa? Yes, there is. <laughs> are there institutions built under the constitution to take care of uh, such situation, yes, there. So, what is South Africa doing? First attack is on South Africa. Mm -hmm. Then the neighborhood. You know, DR Congo has also suffered similar fate. DR Congo citizens are just just hated in South Africa. I mean, it's an open secret. Mm -hmm. Then 
The next is Zambia, Zimbabwe. No, all the adjoining countries, Mozambique, they all come to South Africa just to find greener pastures, call it. And so the neighborhood must also speak up. Mm. They have SADC, the South, Southern Africa Development uh, Community. They must speak up because it's a multilateral organization. And when one is affected, the other must be affected. Then the AU must also be forthcoming. I mean, we should mm -hmm. see the AU's anger and uh, be able to suspend South Africa if it be, be possible. You expect the AU to suspend South Africa? If, if it be possible, no, if that no. is what will bring the solution. Because I, 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 I raise a lot of questions about this position because in 2008, 62 people died. That's right. As a result of these xenophobic attacks. Yes. Yes. Then in 2015, yes. the attacks, looting and, and, yes. and Benny, destruction. Yes. Yes. 2019, right. this is the second time That's it's right. happening this year, February and, then, yes. and now, I think. Yes. And we have about seven or eight people who have died as a that, result of exactly. these latest attacks. Yes. And that is the more reason so why I'm why this. does AU have to wait till this point? I, 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 after, I, after 2008, 62 people yes. died, it should be yes. good enough reason exactly. to do something. Exactly, exactly. And that is why now we should be able to, to, to force the AU to speak up. I mean, to, to come out, because look, it is going to bring intra-African kind of problem. Serious one. As I speak to you right now, there is a video doing the rounds where it's alleged that the, the South African High Commission in Abuja has been bombed. Apparently, Nigerians have died. So Nigerian citizens are going to attack their own government to do something. And if you don't take care of the, the, the snowballing effect, the domino effect, it's not good. Because if Ghana is a friend of Nigeria, let's assume, without accepting, uh, then Ghana must be supporting Nigeria in its attack on South Africa, one way or the other. And if South Africa has a friend like uh, any other country, let's say Morocco. So there's the possibility of an intra-African kind of problem. Mm -hmm. And so we must not look at this problem as, oh, South Africa, that's how they are. And uh, it's Nigerians and that kind of thing. It's a serious African problem. And that's why I think the AU must sit up, seriously sit up. Threat, we have suspended Nigeria before. Mm -hmm. We suspended uh, uh, Sudan before. Uh, Morocco got angry with the AU and left. Uh, all these things should sh tell us that as a multilateral organization, we must have a hold on the problems of Africa. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come to you, Madam, and find out your thoughts about what we what Thing the EU should be doing, or if you also expect that the EU should uh, suspend South Africa at this point to send a very clear signal to the government of the day to do something very much more serious than what we are seeing now. Let's take a listen to His Excellency Thepa, uh, Thapilo uh, Maduma, uh, Maduma, Madumani, who is the Deputy High Commissioner of South Africa uh, here in Ghana, and what he's been explaining about this particular situation in South Africa and in his view, what could be contributing to what we're seeing now. I would wish to point out that we are living in an era where everybody with a phone suddenly becomes um, a, news, a source of news. And fake news abound at such a rate it is unbelievable. So it abounds 98% of the things that you hear, or 99 of the things that you see on social media are not true. So we have realized that a social media has contributed a lot to sowing panic, pandemonium, because of their unfounded and fake news. So he says also what, what you're seeing is unfounded and fake news, highly exaggerating the situation in South Africa. Madam Kumar, your thoughts about this first of all? I'm going to seek your, all, all of you reactions to this. But hearing this and what you've been seeing, what's your reaction to this and what you think could be the undercurrent um, about what's happening in South Africa? I think any life lost is one life too much lost in these at attacks and therefore whether it's been exaggerated or not there is indeed factual evidence to suggest that some people have lost their lives and the south african government must set up and be seen to be doing more than you know talking about fake news and exaggerated information um i think the south african issue is a very complex one 
as um, Dr. Entridanso suggested, you have their history of apartheid. And I think that in itself has more or less built the psyche of the average South African today. For many years, all they've known is violence. Oh. And so violence is the language they speak. And when they are frustrated, the only way out is to more or less, you know, express it through violence. And so I am not at all, um, I'm not at all surprised at what is going on, but I think it's really sad. It's sad that post-apartheid, South Africa has not really taken steps to re reorient mindset in you know the, the 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 social fabric of that society, and so you still have the overhang of apartheid playing today. So these are men and women who are largely helpless in the face of the real issue. The real issue being the, 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 the backlog of um, apartheid and fighting the, the economic issues from the position that we all know where um, made itself, white South Africans has largely hijacked the economy and decide that we're not going to do anything, we're just going to sit, keep our money in our banks and watch you suffer. And South Africans haven't found a way to govern themselves as they ought to. And it brings to play for me, because I'm sitting from the position of the um, civic education, from civic education, the real importance of civic education in the continent of Africa. You see today, for instance, in NCC, we have visits from other African countries coming to learn and understudy the work and role of NCC in nation building. And you have an increase in those visits. It tells you we're beginning to understand that if we're going to move forward as a continent, it's important for us to reorient mindset, to illuminate civic understanding and civic orientation, for us to know that we must take destiny of our, our own nation building and move forward in that, in that direction. So for me, South Africa is a typical example of a country that has largely failed its people in building mindset that transforms that country. And that is why we find that expression in the violence that we see. More importantly, we have not, and Dr. Ndridansu spoke about it, we haven't seen the AU take a very serious role and position in this regard. We, we are looking at it, some people are looking at it, oh, it's South Africa and a few, you know, um, minority um, of, uh, you know, other, other countries, countries mm -hmm. in there. But it bodes a bigger challenge for our continent. You have the two biggest economies here, South Africa and Nigeria who are the main actors in this, as we see today, because there are reprisal attacks in, and, and, in and Nigeria. And there's been an economic reaction to That is it, and, and, that and, is it. And it doesn't bode well for us economically, politically, as a continent. People are looking on at us. We have the resources. Today we are told that Africa's resources surpasses every continent. And we are allowing ourselves to be destroyed like this because of violence. And AU must take a definite position on this, a strong position in bringing parties to the table. And by now, I would have expected strong condemnation from the AU. I would have expected AU moving to South Africa. Maybe they are working behind the scenes, because sometimes they do a lot of well, that. Well, we but sometimes know. it's good that you let people know exactly what you're that doing. Is the, and that is a fact. I, 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 would, I would find out whether the deafening silence of the AU, if that's how to describe it, at least we haven't heard from them as yet. Yeah. Uh, is something that is actually helping the situation. But now to that, say, would, would you agree that the, uh, the, the, after apartheid, there was a political transition, but not a mental transition for the South Africans to accept you know, the diversity that exists in the country? Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> well, I would like to dedicate my opening to President Mugabe, who mm. passed couple of days. I mean, really, <laughs> that's one of the greatest African patriots, you know, and also represents the, some of the challenges we are seeing today no. 
in South Africa. Of course, we're going to come to that, but it's well, so going ahead of me. I think that it's, I, fine, yes. oh, it's part of the history. And um, I, I think that, first of all, uh, what is happening in South Africa has been said already. It's not new. True. Secondly, it's not peculiar to, to South Africa. <laughs> Ghana, only yeah, last year, we were seeking to kick out Nigerian uh, traders. Also, uh, early part of this year yeah, as well. Right, early uh, part of this year. Yeah. You get me? We, it was in the past, you know, where we kicked out so many Nigerians and then they retaliated in 1982. It was a real disaster for us where we saw him. troops, you know, shiploads of Ghanaians. They came. We had to set up a whole townships for them. It was a very tough situation, you know. But South Africa is a peculiar situation in the sense that we all join, and I mean we all, all of us in Africa, you know, suffered the brand of uh, apartheid. I said, in 1964, I was sleeping up. My, the guy who slept down there was from South Africa, Zenia. You know, one of the uh, one of your freedom fighters. I, I saw him, he was an elderly guy, you know, and there he was. He had a, a little pack. You come, you get a pack of uh, money, Ghana money, of dollars, to sustain you during the period that you when they go training. Mm -hmm. This is Ghana, I'm talking about Ghana, nowhere else. Mm -hmm. African Affairs Division of uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, foreign uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, the building, that, that structure, that's where it was. The various heads of states, uh, leaders, and whatnot, they were all coming there. It's a UNESCO heritage that we broke down. You see, we destroy our history, and then we don't learn from our history. And that's the consequence of what we've seen. South Africa should never forget apartheid. You should never forget those who stood by them and fought for them. Zambia was decimated. I mean, it was destroyed. The economy was destroyed on account of uh, regular bombings by the apartheid regime. Mozambique, you know, they lost the president on account of that. The frontline states, even Nigeria, those of us out in Ghana, this is our money. We all stood by them. You see, so at this critical time, you cannot say, is that we are foreigners. What happened to African unity and the call for African unity? I think we, the, the essential thing is, as Madame said, education. We must remember our history. We must remember where we come from. It looks like those who fought the liberation war, of course they are fading away. As I guess you can imagine them. Before. Many of them are dying off. The history is waning. The new generation, knows and remembers very little about how we've come that far. Mm -hmm. 25 years after democracy, you know, mm -hmm. they can see the challenges ahead of them. So they forget and they think that the Africans who are there are the problem. Yes, six million, you know, migrants are in uh, South Africa today. <laughs> How, how much of that really <laughs> would make a very huge impact on the total population itself? Because six million really is, is almost negligible if you look at the... the Absolutely. The and not, not the only that. You see, you, you, you have to go beyond and analyze where is the wealth itself. 98%, 98% of it is in the hands of the old system. You know, it has not translated into the people down there. So we are fighting... <laughs> the two of us, the African, you know, um, slum dwellers and the South African slum dwellers, they are on the same level. You see, we are fighting over maybe 1% or 2% of, of the GDP. So, so we need to educate ourselves. We also need to get hold of the leadership and let them remember President Ramaphosa and others, they were our leaders. We had them, their, their, their uh, uh, pictures, hung in our rooms, all with the university. We fought for them. We knew a picture of Nelson Mandela. When he came out, he was a totally different person. That we had all the image we had. You see, that, these were our heroes. I'll tell you one little secret. I was with uh, President, um, the late President Mills, Atta Mills. Mm. 
And we were just having a chat, and he was reminiscing on when he was at the LSE or so. The, oh, they used to go out every day to, you know, uh, pick it on uh, what they call it, South Africa, apartheid. And then the British police would come and hit them on the head with the buttons. And then they would charge and then they would rush back to school. The next day they are refreshed and they come back. You see, we all suffered. So I want to dedicate my first intro to mm -hmm. the fact that we should never forget, or South Africa should never forget our history and the goals and the objectives of uh, the African leaders. Kwame Nkrumah suffered on account of his, you know, uh, pointed, you know, uh, support for South Africa. Mm -hmm. Even after yeah. death, people are attacking Kwame Nkrumah for, sure. you know, abusing or misusing Ghanaian resources into the fight for uh, freedom and decolonization in the... Uh, to, to feed into that broader vision of a united Africa. So would you agree that, that the, the action or inaction on the part of the African Union over the period hasn't really helped in addressing this situation to a larger extent? Yes. Yes, I think I think I'm sending me uh, AU is AU. I mean, what is what is it? We need a stronger um, Africa. I think they've done as much as they can, but we we need the the, the big vision of the 1958 must come back. <coughs> Africa must unite. We are weak and uh, poverty driven and all that. Where are, where are we going? You know. Now look at what we're doing. We are fight. What are we fighting over? These are the things that Kwame Nkrumah talked about. That if you don't take care, we'll be fighting over poverty. And that's exactly what we're doing. <laughs> we are not going so far. Africa must go back to the you know, blackboard. We must go back. What is it that we can do to bring back our consciousness, blackness? What can, is it that we must do to bring back that our unity? Europe is just moving out. Britain is struggling. <laughs> they want to get out of uh, you know, the EU. But what's happening? We can see the resistance, you see. The bigger Africa will be stronger, and then we can deal with the real challenges on the ground. But the South African government has an obligation to protect the lives and uh, properties of Africans or whoever is within their territory. Mm -hmm. That is an international obligation, and it's an obligation that they cannot run away. And they will worsen things if they divert opinion, you know, or, or the challenges that they are facing, what they are confronted with, what they are finding difficult to deal with by saying, oh, it's the foreigners. That we are entitled to slam them. Mm -hmm. We all agree that the, the government has, has failed. I don't know if that mentioned also. I wanted to tag on what Nana has just said and go back to what the Deputy High Commissioner yes, uh, talked about as if as it were uh, because of he says it's fake news, fake news, it's exaggeration, yes, of exaggeration, and that sort of thing. My advice to <laughs> South African leadership and to high commissions and embassies everywhere is for them to realize that what is happening is a reality. There is the possibility of the fakeness of some parts of it, but as far as it is a reality, and the the images that are being produced and shown to us, there is no amount of witchery or prayers that could mitigate what we're saying. Mm. So diplomatically, my advice to them is to not, you know, add salt to the injury. I believe saying that it is fake news does not take away the reality of the fact that there was a xenophobic attack and that somebody had died. That cannot be fake news. Mm. It cannot take away what happened in 2015 or in February this year. It cannot take away what had happened earlier. We don't solve the problem this way. They are insulting the sensibilities of Africans. There is the reality of a problem. And if I were him, I wouldn't talk the way I was talking. Earlier on, some news went around, I read it on PCFM uh, online, where the High Commissioner herself had said that you know, African countries should create jobs, should create for, jobs their for their citizens and so that they can probably stop It's very undiplomatic. I sit here and I, I, it's in my field and it's very, very undiplomatic. There is no country that can put a wall. Even Trump is unable to do it. 
You can't put a wall around your country and say only your citizens can work in your country. It doesn't happen anywhere. So le there's no legitimacy to that claim Abs that absolutely solve your economic challenges. Absolutely, then absolutely. The the contradiction in that is not is not is not difficult to find. Okay, if South Africa also solved their own economic problems, wouldn't there be jobs for those who say they have lost jobs? So it's like yes, everybody must have make an attempt to solve their economic problems so that there are jobs in every country. That doesn't mean people will not move from one country to another. That's all I'm saying. And now, when one person moves to, from one country to another, whether it's legitimate or illegitimate, that's so-called illegal or legal migrants or immigrants, the government, the host country, has an obligation to everybody. If I enter your country illegally, and you allowed yourself, you, you gave me a chance to enter illegally, you still have a, an obligation to, we have, it's like you have a contract to me. So long as I'm within your jurisdiction. Exactly. So all human rights obligations apply. It does. And I think that was a contention between Ghana and the United States when they said we should give them documents for them to come out. Mm. <laughs> by international law, simple. Did you allow somebody to enter into your country? And by how? <laughs> you know? So that is the thing. The contention is that once the people are in South Africa, South African government has obligation to them. If you want to deport them, you have every right. You have every right to de de declare anybody persona non grata and send him away. But you have no right to kill the person because he's engaged in something. And the South African High Commissioner also said that most of them were engaged in illegal activities. Mm -hmm. And I asked the question, are there no <coughs> institutions in South, South, South Africa? So... What is the illegality? And is it the law that anybody engaged in illegality must be, must be lynched? Mm -hmm. So the High Commission must know how to talk and, and, and should not arouse the, the anim animal instincts in, in people. Because as I said, it could I mean, ignite reprisal attacks which are more you know, insane than we're saying. And it's not far-fetched because what's happening in Nigeria is a clear, clear indication, indication. Yes. of what could happen if, yes. if the situation is not changed. Exactly. But does it not rather raise a, a further concern that this has been happening in separate or different administrations, okay, but obviously the same ANC? How has the actions and inactions or comments of politicians in South Africa you know, influences because if this happened first in 2008, I mean, the, the, the recent past where 62 people died, 2015 we had shops looted and destroyed, 2019 February, and now we're talking about it. Does it rather strike you that even though there are different administrations that come in, you still have this, and there is really no firm action to discourage or to deter people from repeating this? I have only one, one, one sentence. It shows that South African governments are weak. Period. Weak. The system is not working. State institutions are failing. The system is not working. Whether it is to educate the people or whether it is to let, remind them of their history, and I mentioned that, and my sister mentioned oh, this education, that it means something is wrong. Come again. Your sister, your uh, uh, my sister and my student. <laughs> <laughs> For my student. <laughs> Even if you look old, huh? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> school. School. Oh, I see. Primary school teacher. Yes. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> you know, so, so it's like government is failing. If we are being accused of failing in our uh, economic development so that our, our citizens stay here, mm -hmm. then it, the same finger can be pointed at them to say that they are failing. On and on and on. Why are they not able to solve the problem? And it's repeating itself. It's a failure. Dr. Singh? I agree. And I think um, we haven't heard or seen any proper sanctions that have been meted out <coughs> to perpetrators mm -hmm. of this crime. To serve as a deterrent. To serve as a deterrent. Mm -hmm. So 2008, 2015, and twice this year, people have perpetrated actions, such you know, criminal active actions against um, foreigners, 
largely they've gone scot-free. So, of course, people think, well, we can do this and get away with it because they've done it and gotten away with it. So I believe strongly that we, we should see a, a strong sanctioning system and regime in South Africa where the police, the, ju the justice system is working and affords every individual in South Africa that protection and also ensures that people who come out and um, meet out um, and violence against um, alien, sorry, foreigners are properly dealt with. When we've seen that, then we see that the deterrence in there and people begin to sit up and know that if I indulge in such activities, there are clear sanctions that will be, you know, I would suffer for these actions. <coughs> I would also take a listen to Sarah Mafosa earlier in the week, just to at least put this also in, in, in the proper context. What politicians or, or the, the leaders of this particular country, South Africa, have been saying about the latest attacks in that country. Let's take a look. Now I'd like to condemn the violence that has been spreading around a number of provinces in our country in the strongest terms. The attacks on people who run businesses from foreign nationals is something that's totally unacceptable. It's something that we cannot allow uh, to happen in South Africa where people who are running their own businesses are attacked and they are Businesses are destroyed through looting and uh, being firebombed, uh, something that uh, is completely against the ethos that we as South Africans espouse. So that's the president of South Africa, Sir Bob Mafosa, there uh, earlier in the week. But, um, Madam Nkuma, that's the demeanor, or the posture of Sir Bob Mafosa, say, anything <laughs> or that's what signal does it send to you how does it actually back the words that he's uh, speaking oh we all know that body language says a lot and so i mean your words can the words you uttering can say something and then your demeanor can you know tell us a totally different story i think this is a man who is for me i think helpless or there's some i don't know it's like he, he's lost in all of this he doesn't really know what to do, and um, so he's uttering these words, and really you, what we are seeing is a man who is wondering, how are we going to solve this problem? Is this above us? Can we do it? Or are we? do we even want to concern ourselves with this? Maybe it's going to die like the other ones have, you know, eventually panned out. So maybe let's say, wait, let's wait and see mm. attitude. So what ethos are you talking about here? Because um, past history tells us that this cannot be um, this is not against the ethos now. I sure. mean, we are seeing that rather now as more of what South Africa is becoming known for, violence, crime, and, 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 and really we want to see stronger words, stronger action from the president of South Africa, you know, condemning this passionately and not have this very passive approach as, as, and you know no we want to see strong action from them and when you, you see <coughs> this kind of demeanor and then you hear comments that are being passed in high commissions such as the one in, uh, in, in Ghana then you begin to wonder are they really um, are they really uh, is there a real desire to bring this to an end is there a real desire to find a solution to the problem or they just think pack bag and baggage and leave our country <coughs> and perhaps that will solve our problems but that will not solve the problems of of south africa and i am still worried about the fact that um the reprisal attacks we're seeing in, 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 in Nigeria, you can begin very soon. I wouldn't be surprised to hear that it's happening in other African countries. And there begins an implosion. We are sitting here talking it's already, about... It's already yes, happening. We're sure. talking so about... Truckers. Yes. We're oh, talking yes. about... Um, mm -hmm. Was it the African Free Continental free Trade? Area. And mm -hmm. this, for me, this begins to bode badly for, for that whole concept where we're trying to bridge the gaps and build a stronger economy for the continent where people will then sit back and say I'm not going to do trade with this country I'm not going to do trade with that so it brings the whole of Africa backwards and we can't afford this at this time we are at that tipping point where the AU again I say must get up 
and speak loudly against it. And we want to see clear actions from various, you know, countries, their leadership, speaking vehemently against this and finding solutions to the problems and more importantly, protecting every individual in South Africa, foreign or South African. We need to ensure that no more lives are lost because some lives that are lost, you will have for generations. People will never forget sure. that. No, no, certainly, there's a lot more action needed and less of words at this point, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Certainly, certainly um, the, 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 the reaction or the belated reaction of uh, the South African president is, is unfortunately a little depressing, I would say. The depressing. He really, the president came out only after the strong reprisals in Nigeria. You understand? Sure. And we've heard what he's saying. But you must understand a South African president of today, particularly coming out from ANC. You see, <laughs> it's a structure of their constitutional order. Let me. It's largely populist. No, you, yeah, I say you should never forget their, their history, where they've come from. You know, people have fought. All kinds of persons have authority. You know, if you go to Zambia, uh, Zimbabwe, you know, the ZDF, for instance, the Defense Force, and others, and the, the, the Patriots, the old Patriots who fought, they have very strong control. So it makes leadership tough. Yeah. So really, when you are a president, you must know how to handle the situation, particularly when you are going against, you know, the people. You know, it's a populist approach to things. Sure. It's a deflection of the of the anger the, 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 of the people to something else, you know. But I think the bottom line is that no matter what it takes, a leadership, a president, a president or any state has an obligation to the people, all the people in that country. That is primary. You see, in any civilized situation, whether you're a stranger or whatnot, you know, in the Ghanaian constitution is clear that the constitution covers everybody in the country, whether a foreigner, what not, even if for one hour you are here, you are protected, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that the, you, you saw the reaction in Nigeria. Sure. Even the prompt, hard, harsh, you know, uh, response from the Nigerian uh, police sure. to stem the flow. Otherwise, and you would have seen it. One Nigerian was dead yes. or, uh, or died as a result exactly. of this particular... Exactly. Exactly. To protect see? South African That's businesses, true. including businesses owned by Mr. President Ramaphosa, MTN, yes. and all this, throughout the country. You see, when we are saying this, we are seeking to support and uh, our, our friends and our brothers and our comrades in South Africa, that they should hold the line, you know. Yes. Otherwise, we will have a problem in Africa. A clear action that needs to be taken to send us uh, to, to, to the test. I think he was overwhelmed by the events and he didn't know what to do. Mm. And I don't know whether he has, his advisors advised him very well. Small speech could have. Because he needed to address his people, like Nana is saying. He owes allegiance to them. He must know their psyche and must know those words he has to choose to address them. Assuage their, you know, persuade them to, you know, calm down. Mm. Then he must address Africa yeah, and address the world. <laughs> the, I didn't see that. I, I, I see. And, and, and to the extent that, that I think that, yes. You know, there was a speech yes, that Malema made. As a matter of fact, I was going to take Malema's speech okay. after this. But I think that Nana Todazi uh, raised this question about the timing of this particular speech yeah. when it came after the reprisal attacks in, in Nigeria. Maybe an earlier reaction or response from the president could have done a lot more good than what, what, what we are yeah. seeing now. At, at whatever point that he was about to speak, he must choose his words and target the audience in such a way that it sinks. That's what the president does. Yes, a populist kind of psyche in South, South Africa, or the soul of Southern Africa has that psyche, but addressing his people, showing a little anger to say that. He said, this is not the ethos. We, we, okay, fine. So I'm going to ask the police to do this and do that and do that. And even maybe to the foreigners who have been attacked and that sort of thing, we will do everything to do A, B, C, including assuring them that we will see compensation and that kind of thing. These things will not let anybody be angry. Sure. But, but it, it waters every anger down. Then you address Africa. 
because the African countries who are involved. Absolutely. Then you address the world. No, this is not the South Africa we're portraying to you. Uh, because look, a lot of uh, foreign direct investors might look at this thing and say, tomorrow it might be me. True. You know? It's, it's very deterring enough. But you're still live here on Key Point, here on TV3. Stay with us. We're going to go for this quick break. When we back, we settle on, if I conclude on this particular conversation, get into whether we should be focusing on Ghana beyond corruption rather than Ghana beyond aid. We'll be back shortly after this to stay. Welcome back to Key Points here on TV3. Remember, we're live on 3FM 92.7. Also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook and keep sharing your thoughts with us all across the world on 3news.com. We're very, very live and interactive. You definitely have a say in what we've been saying here in the studio. So keep your thoughts coming through. I'll definitely be reading them as we go on. But uh, we, we're going to conclude on this conversation on the latest xenophobic attacks in South Africa. But quickly, let's take a listen to Julius Malema who is a member of parliament in South Africa and also the leader of the Economic Freedom Fighters and what he's been saying about the xenophobic attacks as well. It's wrong. Crime is crime. Let's deal with it as crime. When it is a white person in South Africa, undocumented, he's called an investor. Not only a white person, including Indians and Chinese, but if it was my African brothers, we're going to be called Kwerekweres because they don't have papers. Self-hate. It must come to an end. If it means making the EFF lose votes for that, let it lose votes. Lose votes on principle, not on political expediency of wanting to appeal. This country belongs to Africans in the same way Nigeria belongs to South Africans. Nigeria is South Africa. South Africa is Nigeria. We are Zimbabweans. We need to do away with this nonsensical idea that was imposed on, on us by colonizers, by Theresa May ancestors. Mm. that we, we must dislike each other. That's Julius Malema there. You could say age is on his side because he's youthful, but I mean, <laughs> there's really a lot more to body language than just the age of a person. Mm -hmm. Dr. Vladimir Chidan, so your thoughts on, on, on this? Well, basically, I, I have been following Malema's uh, uh, exploits and uh, the way he speaks and things like that. You could see that he is a die in the wool Pan Africanist. Mm -hmm. I've listened to a lot of his speeches, and he's always talk, talking about removing the borders, uh, getting Pan Africanism to work, getting one Africa tomorrow. So he's a Pan Africanist in that sense. And therefore, I don't think he will be supporting what is going on. Uh, but he tends it also with his anger against the type of governance that is going on yes. in his own country yes. and against <clears throat> those. Um, uh, who wield power through economic power, I mean, the whites and that kind of thing. So, well, well said, but uh, you must channel it more to his party and to uh, cause a change. Because within his party, there are several militants mm. who behave the way these ones are behaving. Only it doesn't come to that. Uh, I like him for his fiery kind of character, and uh, I trust him. He's a, he's a real Pan-African. Some of the words he spewed out should have come from the president. And the anger he's showing should have come from the president. Mm. So I doff my hat for him. Great. Madam. <laughs> well, I, 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 did talk, I did allude to him earlier mm. on. And, yes. um, Malema really exudes that kind of, um, the new African that you, would, you want to see, who sees beyond the borders of individual countries and speaks to a united Africa. Africa. Maybe um, Ramaphosa has a few <laughs> lessons to to learn from Malema and in, in, in assuring the larger African continent that um, South Africa thinks of the African continent rather than looking insular only at itself. Mm. So I'd like to see um, the South African president speaking more passionately about this matter and assuaging the fears of many Africans that live in South Africa today. Anna, your concluding thoughts on this while we hope for a more peaceful South Africa going forward? Um, <laughs> you preempted my <laughs> thought process. I, yes, uh, yes, I, I can see it. If we, our reaction, the reaction of the rest of Africa mm -hmm. is, um, comes out of the way it's coming out, you know, we must put some of the diplomacy aside and tell our brothers out in South Africa, the leadership, what it is. 
how we feel. You see, the nice night. Part of diplomacy. Saying that is this. It's part of diplomacy. Yes, okay. Maybe it's maybe I understand it's diplomacy. We must be diplomatic. Diplomatic and presenting and all that. You see, the 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 problem that we're facing is that. Um, there, there are two sets of uh, arrangement that we see. You know what is the reality, like you say, on the ground, and how it's presented. But you fully nobody. Yeah. We all see. We all know what is happening. Sure. You understand? So for me, like Malema, provides a ray of hope for the future. Not him as a person. Maybe his style may be problematic. But so long as there is some youth out there. And inside Ghana and other way, uh, elsewhere, that it means that there is hope for the future. That the, the, the aims, the aspirations of the 1950s of um, um, an African unity, a united Africa, mm -hmm. is not lost. You know, a common African uh, uh, economic uh, uh, free zone, zone yeah, mm -hmm. is not lost. A common African, uh, intra Africa movement. You know, transport and all those things. You know, it's not lost. Those things are lost. And then we can also re educate our people. You understand? Because at times we get scared that is it all lost? Was it a waste of time? Should Kwame Nkrumah be turning his grave? You'll be talking about Mugabe. Mm -hmm. what, what, what happened to all the sacrifices? Our people's minds, our youth, they are in America and Britain and elsewhere. What about Africa? You know, and uh, so for me, it, it, it is. 1884-85, you know, was a, an imposed and enforced situation, a balkanization of Africa, mm -hmm. the scramble for Africa and whatnot. We didn't have a say. They sat somewhere and shared and broke our country sure. into pieces. The consequences of which we are still living with, you know, how many years after decolonization, we're so weak and poor, you know, understand. Now, this time around, we are worsening the situation, but we ourselves consciously and voluntarily destroying that little that is left of our unity, of our strength, and whatnot. That's not that they shouldn't live it. So for me, Malema and others, you may like them, you may dislike them, but in terms of hope, they give us hope for the future. <laughs> and I'm not talking about him alone, that we hope we can see Ghanaian youth who rise up and see the Nigerian youth as one. We must introduce a greater cultural exchange. We must open up. You have to try driving from Ghana to Nigeria. You see the challenges, the problems. I did it last, the other time, last year. Mm -hmm. Horrible. True. <laughs> but can, well, the situation is calm now uh, from what we do know. But can we say of a certainty that we're not going to be having this conversation again? Well, they, I'm saying that, uh, yes, it will take some years. Like Ghana, I mean, the challenge is going to take a bit, uh, depending upon the speed with which we we'll get a peaceful South Africa, or for that matter, a prosperous um, Africa, you know, will depend upon decisions that will be taken by our leaders, you understand? Mm. I mean, it's a big problem. The problem we're facing is not just about what we're seeing in South Africa uh, today. We're talking about today. You know, sure. where is the world? Where has the world gone to? How is our social, economic, you know, arrangement uh, being uh, managed so that the wealth of the nation is spread out, you understand, to people? Listen, you, we also have the slums. You go to our places, go to Nigeria, go elsewhere. Get me. We must be concerned with bigger and larger challenges or problems within our continent. You understand? Mm. And I think that it's so easy. It's, you can't just say, oh, after today, it will not going to happen. It will happen. It's going to happen again. Because the underlying problem or problems are there. They're almost endemic. You understand? Mm. And when are you going to get poverty out of the way? You know? <coughs> Quite worrying. Nana mentioned uh, 1884, 85, November 1884 to February 1885, when Africa was shared, like sharing meat, you know, among the European powers. And I believe that it is only when that historical event is wiped out, and I'm talking about real integration, for as long as we remain fragmented respecting our borders given to us from 1884-85.
we're going to see this thing and more of that. And that was why Nkuma was calling for rapid African integration. So we see ourselves as Africans. One currency from Cape to Cairo, you riding, like he's saying, from here to Lagos. It's a problem. But Nkuma was thinking of riding from Cape to Cairo without hindrance. Mm -hmm. So we are a one African continent, one continental government. You know, he was looking ahead even before Europe started their own, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. He was looking at a situation where we have United States of Africa, Africa yeah. with all our resources belonging to us. We see ourselves as, you know, citizens of Africa. Mm -hmm. Until that time, but we could have made a speed of the speed. We would have we speeded that process if the second generation of African leadership uh, didn't forget what the nationalists started for us. One of them being Mugabe. And that actually leads, that statement leads us directly into Robert Mugabe. Uh, certainly, we would not say that he, the, the troubles of his last years uh, would negate the legacy that he has left uh, behind, not only for Zimbabwe, for the entire continent. Dr. Vladimir Chidansu. Well, I spoke to several um, media houses yesterday, including BBC. And um, I think BBC was surprised that I look upon him as a hero. And I said, he is a hero. He was talking about putting people in prison, destroying the economy. And I took the lady through some lessons. I still feel he's a hero. How did Zimbabwe, you know, started to slide down? The Lancaster Agreement was not obeyed by Britain to deny the tenets of the agreement being fulfilled means that you are denying Zimbabwe the path towards prosperity. The 20 billion that Tony Blair said, I won't pay. And because Mugabe took it upon himself to know, okay, you won't pay, fine. This is what I want to do. Then sanctions. So who, who destroyed the Zimbabwe economy? It's not, it's not Zimbabweans, it's not Mugabe. But the resilience shows that he believed in what Nkrumah said, that we must demonstrate to the, to the world that, after all, the African is capable of managing his own affairs, and they managed. <laughs> I returned from Zimbabwe some few months back, and, and I was astounded by what I saw, that the narrative that we are being given is not correct. They have a resilient economy. The bond, or the dollar they call it, Zimbabwean dollar, is 3.50 to a dollar. Away from some four or five years back when it was hundreds of thousands, when the currency was not even being used and they were using the rand. Look, my brother, Mugabe was, how do I call him? Was resilient. He believed in a path he's chosen. And if in the path there were problems and mishaps and call him a dictator or whatever it is, it is part of the progress that he wanted to make. So for me, the resilience is a big legacy. That he was able to withstand this, I don't know, Ghana, we have never had it. When it, we call it the, the establishment. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, the, and then he showed also that, look, you, you should be able to resist impositions. And he did. Always our government, including our own Ghanaian governments, have always had shrinking policy space. He didn't bother about that. Don't recruit people for three years, and then we obey. Don't do this. Don't do this. Structure adjustment. Yes, Zimbabwe withstood all the tribulations, all the impositions, and they are still there as Zimbabwe. Long serving, yes, dictatorship. I will always prefer a dictator who knows where he's going with me to a Democrat who is pandering to the whims of somebody else. That will go down as a quote for the morning. So Thank you. <laughs> probably <laughs> yes. <laughs> You will prefer a dictator who knows where he is going exactly. than a Democrat. To a Democrat who is pandering to who the is whims. Pandering to the to whims, whims of, of, of the whites. Of the whites. <laughs> Just note that. It came from Dr. Vladimir Jidansu. Madam Ekoma. Robert Mugabe, 95 years. Robert Mugabe, um, sad to hear he's gone. Um, an icon in African politics that no one can forget. I think what Robert Mugabe was largely misunderstood and perhaps portrayed in the wrong light by 
the media. They always sought to make him look like he was an eccentric old man who knew nothing of what governing his nation was about. But for me, I think it was a matter of no pain, no gain. Let's take the hard knocks now, but let's take control of our destiny. And that is what Mugabe was about. So he was prepared to defy the odds. He was pre pre um, prepared to say, take your policies away on whatever um, economic you know, guidelines and principles you think we should abide by. We want to take our country back. We want our land back because our destiny must be driven by ourselves. And there was a big quote must not, yes. for him. He said, Blair, take your Europe. Ah, I take my Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Yes, and he never ever <laughs> spoke alone for Zimbabwe. True. Mugabe always spoke for Africa. He always spoke for Africa and he always tried to inspire the African leaders to stand up against you know any kind of imposition be it economic or otherwise <coughs> that is what Mugabe stood for mm. perhaps if we had more leaders to a certain extent who looked at some of these policies reviewed them and said you know something I would I, I hear you but I'm going to run this my way mm. we may in the short term suffer a little but in the long term, we would be building the African who understands how to govern himself and herself. And today, if um, what I'm hearing from um, Dr. Entridanso is right, it means that the economy is bouncing back. Yes. And do we even hear this in the, no, in the no, media? No, no, we no. Don't. We're still less hearing things about the bad legacy that Mugabe left. Mm -hmm. But today you have many more Zimbabweans who have land that they own, who are economically empowered exactly. and are taking you know, um, their destiny in their own hands and moving their country forward. Sometimes we are too quick to want the, you know, the, 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 the success now. And so we don't understand the fight and the struggle and the suffering we must go through for the longer for the for the gain that we would have in the in the long future in the long term. But I think we need to revisit some of these issues. We need to revisit some of these um, policies that oftentimes are, you know, um, imposed on us, and begin to ask ourselves. In the long term, where do we want to go? And do we honestly think that we're going to achieve it? I mean, we're all, all, most African countries are going through a lot of economic hardships. Mm -hmm. And it's finding expression in what is happening in South Africa and otherwise. Perhaps AU should look at this and look at building resilient economies within Africa where we are self, you know, in, independent of uh, what, ki what kinds of trades and all these policies that are going on. We should look at building, as he said, intra-African trade, mm -hmm. a more fluid economy, more organic, where Africa is really the Africa that we want from Cape to Cairo, understanding that we are one people. We have one, one continent, and we must move in that direction. Certainly move in that direction. And that's uh, Mabekoma there talking to us. But clearly, it's a rather one that should raise a lot of concern uh, for us, you know, as a continent, if we, we're not able to place certain persons uh, who have made very clear statements in complementing that, that drive, that mm -hmm. demand for a united Africa, and actually tell the story of our own selves, yeah. you know, at, 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 at this point. And, and I, so sometimes you'd, ha you'd have people who, um, because of the fear of the unknown, or not knowing what will happen after they are, they are out of power, especially when they've started a particular vision, driving the country in a particular way, you have them hold on to power to want to conclude or get to a very considerable point in the pursuance of their vision before handing over power. Do you think that Robert Mugabe fell to that temptation and probably led to those troubles of the last years? Well, in a sense, yes. <laughs> when you write in a tribute, you must have an open mind. Look at the weaknesses and the strengths and whatnot. But Mukabe essentially was a human being. Um, what's happening, you know, shows the finiteness of man. You see, it's some of the things that we should learn is the fact that power ends 
for any individual at a point in time, whether one term, two terms, or whatnot. But we tend in Africa, because of the alternative power structure that exists, chieftaincy and whatnot, where a chief lives in perpetuity until he dies, you get me? Mm. When our people get into political office, the tendency is for them to believe that they are chiefs. And we call them chiefs. And we treat them like chiefs. But power should be seen as a, you know, something that's given to you for a limited period. Mm. So it shouldn't change you that much. You, you come and serve and go. Now, um, the, 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 the problem with Africa in terms of democracy is it's, it's just that, that people get into office and we ourselves treat them in such a way that they must remain until death. You, you, you understand? It's changing. But it's not changing that fast. You know, whether in Ghana or elsewhere, we think we must perpetuate ourselves. We build, you know, reserves for the future to continue. And we must understand that there will be a change. That's what I'm interested in. The transition will come when it comes. Yeah. Now, so having said that, I think that uh, Mugabe was a great man. He was one of the greatest pan Africanists. I think that Ghana should be proud that Mugabe had his beginnings in Ghana. Mm. He was part of Kwame Nkrumah's, you know, uh, what do you call it? Fruits. You understand? Whether in Malawi, what not, all of them, they were spawned out of yeah. Ghana's and uh, Kuma's commitment. You know, they went there and he fought. It was a very difficult battle. It was a bush war. They were locked up. They were mistreated. We can't tell you some of the things which happened to them individually and personally. Very wicked treatment were uh, subjected to, you know, uh, Uhuru and others. Uh, the Kenyatta. Yeah. Sorry, the old man. All of them. Jomo. Jomo, yeah. Jomo you know that. You see, but they were able to overthrow the challenges, the very challenging situations of the times. Right. Like apartheid. Nobody ever thought apartheid could ever be destroyed. Yes. But as I said, he transformed his country. It was one of the highest educated or literate True. country in yes. the world. Yes. He himself had more than six different degrees. Yes. And really end. You get me? And uh, it is uh, the economy of um, Zimbabwe is what it is because of so many other external factors. Wasn't but of course the internal dynamics which uh, we all understand today. You understand? Mm -hmm. And I think that really um, I, I, I hope that Zimbabwe or Zimbabweans will find a way of reconciling you know, very fast with themselves mm. to give this hero a real hero's, what do you call it, um, funeral and burial. You know, back in the hero's, uh, uh, what do you call it, corner. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, he deserves he it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He has he's served his country, he served his, uh, his continent, and I think that uh, he deserves to rest. 95, we thank God for his life, you know. Yeah, the challenges which he encountered uh, over the last uh, few years, we all know and understand the weaknesses. And that's a, what I term the finiteness of man. At a point in time, you must know that you cannot be a president yes. for life. We should just exercise that one. That is the only point at which I will disagree with my colleague, uh, Professor Hevadim NG, that dictatorship is really one in the mind. You get me? We can still have others take over, take over from us. And then the struggle will continue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nana uh, Tudatsi. Uh, the uh, dictatorship is in the mind. But certainly, if that dictatorship in the mind will, is giving you a particular direction that will take you to a point where it will be desirable than a Democrat leading you to chaos, then you would rather choose a, <laughs> a dictator. So we did the same thing to Kagami. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, in a way. But, but Mugabe but, is still yes. a hero. Let me assure our uh, uh, viewers that mm. uh, you go to Zimbabwe and everywhere you go, it's like he's not being vilified the way we, we have it on there, whatever it is. Yeah. But let me assure you, he's a hero. 
they took us round to the hero's uh, uh, park, uh, park. Mm -hmm. and uh, where he'll be buried is left just close to Sally's. Uh. And they revere their heroes. And that's one thing I just, including even the whites who mm. were who were part of the revolution. Mm. Their tombs were all there. Right. It's, it's amazing. Certainly, it is. And his soul will continue to rest in perfect peace. Nanato does the international politician, uh, political tra transi transitional expert, and also a former chief of staff here in the Republic of Ghana, Dr. Vladimir Nchidanso, still with us in studio, who is the Dean of the Academic Affairs at the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College, is an international relations expert with a lot of experience in regional economic cooperation and integration. And uh, Madam Josephine Nkrumah is the chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, NCCE. She's also still with us in studio. Do we opt for a Ghana beyond aid or need a Ghana beyond corruption? I want us to take a listen to the Netherlands ambassador to Ghana to specifically put the issues in the right perspective and exactly what he said so we don't end up taking anything uh, out of context. Take a listen. Nothing so killing for the business climate, and you need a good business climate to attract foreign investment, I think, than corruption. Corruption is a very bad thing. Companies suffer and will stay away if they think that they are going to be harassed by corruption in a certain country. The slogan now is, the official policy is Ghana beyond the AIDS. Why not? Ghana beyond corruption. Thank you. So, yes, do we opt for a Ghana beyond aid or a Ghana beyond corruption? <laughs> Mara, because you have been, you have been, you, yes, uh, Doc, you have a bite on this. You have been very, very stern <laughs> on the fight against corruption <laughs> over the period. Let, let me start off with you. Yeah. Indeed, uh, we'll hear from uh, Yosef Omar for Senior Minister shortly, his reaction to this uh, particular statement by the Netherlands Ambassador. Um, the fight against corruption. Um, firstly, let me say um, the EU has supported the NCC in our program anti-corruption rule of law and accountability in this fight against corruption. It's a four-year um, um, grant. Of course, we can't win the war against corruption in four years. Day in, day out, we're hearing more and more stories about corruption. And the question is, yes, we want a Ghana beyond aid. And um, Ambassador Ron Stryker has thrown in a Ghana beyond corruption. But there is a link. There is a link. I don't think we are going anywhere beyond aid if we do not tackle the issues of corruption. Because corruption continues to um, retard our economy. It continues to leave us worse off as citizens. And ultimately, we will continue to go begging for aid. So we can't have a Ghana beyond aid if we don't tackle corruption. If trillions of dollars are going in the hands of individuals at the expense of the nation's development, at the expense of, our, uh, of economic resilience, then of course we cannot, the Ghana beyond aid will only be an illusion. So we must necessarily tackle the issue of corruption so that the average Ghanaian gets up and knows he can have three square meals, understands that when he is ill or his family is unwell, they can go to a medical facility close by that will take good care of them, sure. who understands that when I get up and I take my child to school, my child will enjoy good educational facilities that make him or her an individual that contributes positively to our, uh, to our nation building. So yes, I, I agree. I think that before we can talk about, about aid, we must necessarily minimize corruption. We must build a strong economy. We must have economic empowerment, especially for uh, minorities, women, children, persons with disabilities. When we have begun to understand the essence of building these people, of making them economically resilient and empowered, then we can begin to talk about Ghana beyond aid. 
before that, we must understand we, we need the values. I con and continue to stress the point of values. When we talk about corruption, there's nothing more than stealing. Just a beautiful word we've coined for thieves. But if we understand that we should stop talking about corruption as some sophistication, some sophisticated crime, and bring it down to what it is, thief, you know, thievery. Ste thievery, stealing, then we would know that we must go back to basics and begin to talk about the values that we need to build our country. If we would talk about Ghana beyond aid, we must talk about corruption. We must talk about the values of honesty, the values of hard work, the values of integrity, the values of service and loyalty to nation. If we don't talk about these things, then the talk about corruption will be, you know, barely, you know, touching the peripherals without going to deal with root causes. We are losing our values as a country. Mm. We are losing our values up to the youngest child. You go to schools, primary schools, and young children during elections are going around giving toffees and, uh, and doing what the politicians do when I come that, to that's office. Scary. And that, that is scary. scary. That is scary. So all this talk about beyond aid, let's go back to basics. Let's talk about what we are doing to build values in the country. And NCC is, is talking about this issue about, about values. And um, the new curriculum, I'm told, has values embedded in it but we must teach values intentionally deliberately with purpose and focus that we want to build a Ghanaian who understands that without these values we are not going anywhere what's the point in going to actually uh, fight work hard bring cheese to your home when the mouse will just come and steal it and not deal with the mouse anyway <laughs> but dr vladimir introduction yes um you know ghana beyond aid uh, I've always said that the Secretariat has a long way to go. They, they've got to do a lot of work. We had a symposium at Legon in Lizazo. People don't even understand Ghana beyond aid. Yeah. If we understand it, then, then, then the goals are very lovely and we can get there. Of course, Ghana beyond aid does not mean Ghana without aid. It will never happen. That's mm -hmm. clear. Yes. Uh, another platform we can discuss there. Absolutely. But the point is, is that Ghana beyond aid must have variables that take us there. And if corruption is one of the variables, we won't get. That's all the ambassador is saying. That variable is, is, is a virus because you cannot plan your economy, making it resilient, aid coming and using the aid for the purpose of getting out of aid in the form of those loans and whatnots and whatnots. And then corruption eats all those things away, like you gave an analogy of the mice eating your cheese. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are you going to eat? Because obviously, you go hard, out there, work <laughs> exactly. hard, buy the cheese, bring them home. So the ambassador not has nailed it there. We don't have to be annoyed with him. For me, it's, it's rather a very good thing. And you know, he's rather setting the agenda by telling us that, look, Ghana beyond aid, corruption is one of, one of the biggest mm. problems if we want to get there. For me, there are other things we can add. Ghana beyond aid must be without indiscipline. Mm. And all, we can add several things that will help us get there. So he's given us only one. <laughs> there are several. Ghana and, and, is so undisciplined. And our, 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 how are we doing in, the, in this the particular thing. one? That, fight, that against fight against corruption. Fight against corruption. How, how are we I doing? I must <laughs> say, though, that the Ghana beyond aid um, document and the, the, what they envisage is to build as well as a values approach, approach yes. to this um, whole Ghana yes. beyond aid. And yes. of course, when you build a values approach, you would be tackling the real issues of corruption. But we need to do it with urgency. Exactly. I must tell you that right now, most of our funding as a commission comes from donor funds. Yes, and sometimes it's almost embarrassing because are you saying that you need aid to build a national psyche and you must go to foreigners to give you money to build your own psyche where are our priorities mm. where are our priorities none of these is going to be realized if we don't begin to build 
the, the average Ghanaian mindset. And yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah, this, this, yeah, this, is a, this is a real concern. And I'm tempted yeah. to ask you how much of the budgetary allocation for this year has been actually released to the NCCE. I must say that this year we are up to, um, we've, we've received the allocations that we need to receive. But that is not the point. The point really is the ceilings no, I, I, that we I'm are I'm just given. asking because you made the point that, in fact, almost all of your funding that runs the commission comes from donor agents. Yes. If, agencies. if the AU funding 67% comes from the EU. That tells you a lot. I rest my case. Africa <laughs> beyond <laughs> eight. <laughs> we, we have to get there. Uh, no. Well, I didn't understand that we were coming to discuss this one. As a matter of fact, <laughs> if you would kindly permit me, yeah. I have just taken a listen to uh, <laughs> your sophomore for senior minister rea yeah. reacting to this, uh, saying that the Netherlands ambassador probably, we, we are misunderstanding his statement. He didn't mean that. Let's take a listen. Ghana Beyond Aid is emphasizing the need to fight corruption. And I think this is all through there. It's emphasizing attitudinal change. It's emphasizing mindset. It's emphasizing core values. Talk about core values, it means that if you are to work for eight hours, you yourself, you must know that you must work for eight hours and be paid for eight hours. You don't go and play last, last year and work for one hour and be paid eight hours. That is corruption. Corruption is not only taking money from the government. Or the, corruption is anything you put in place where you shortchange the system. You shortchange the government. If you are working for eight hours and you are paid eight hours and you work for one hour and you are paid eight hours, that is corruption. So we should look at all this from different angles so that Ghana Beyond Aid becomes a framework that will make our mindset, our attitude to government, to work, everything, be positive and think about Ghana as our own. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Senior Minister, you also have a mouthful there. Nana? Well, well, yes, uh, I think I, I share all the sentiments uh, uh, it's expressed. I mean, and so what? We really are. So what? Where do we go from there? We must practicalize it. You know, some of these things. You understand? Like, I, for the point you made, that it's not only when you collect money that constitutes uh, corruption, but also when you abuse the rules and regulations to, uh, to influence, you know, some friends, you know, family members, whatnot. Those are cro chronism. And those are, these, these are the terrible things. Listen, we've had some horrible exposés of late. Oh, let's see one day, one scandal, whatever it is. We put it in almost in political terms. But let's put it aside. What worries me is that where are the institutions which have been set up by state, by constitution, to deal with these problems? It's like we have a tin of milk, you know, full. And then you hit the, the bottom, and then it's draining. And then you are looking for, you know, the, the, the milk inside there. You know, the bulk of it is just going away. By plugging it, we will have enough, you know, to, to serve everybody else. You got me? PDS, what not? What not? Where did we hear it from? Where did we hear these things from? Not from our regular institutions or state. We got them all from the social media. That is my worry. You see, and these are not small matters. Even if it may not fully be wholly right, they are substantial scandals which our institutions of state should be able to deal with. We only hear about our institutions when they say it's all true, <laughs> or, or that it's all so full, yeah. or that you said the PDS thing was uh, uh, the, 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 the was We're so actually fraud. going to come to that. Okay, look at the next There's no fraud and all that. But uh, let's read the full report. If you read the full, if you are presented, you are at the end of it, you find out that the organization itself was so competent to assume that, 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 that role. So what is it about uh, is the money is not there, they didn't take money, they didn't take what not. That, that, these are not real sentiment elements of corruption. But like I said, for me, what worries me is that the institutions of state, which have been set up, which are funded by the ordinary Guinean, you get me, mm -hmm. or the public, we don't seem to be catching up with the infractions as they are developing. And that is a weakness of the state. If for everything, we must go to the, uh, we read it at the, on the social media level, 
uh, uh, then that's, that, that's not good governance. You understand? Mm. So if you are a leader, you come out and say, we need to fight corruption. We want to hear you say that some people misconducted themselves. We refer them for discipline. And then that's what we go through. It. Because honestly speaking, <laughs> the uh, NDC, MPP, whatnot, everybody is worried. Mm. And that's why the, the minister, uh, senior minister has come out. We are all worried about this perception of corruption and whatnot. What's the truth in it? We must bring it down. Mm. And the only way to do it is to actually investigate dispassionately. You know, if you tell me that somebody is holding a position, somebody has just been suspended, I think, or uh, yesterday or so. Yeah. He didn't okay. have enough the, uh, sufficient qualification to be an inspector of um, health, uh, you know, facilities and whatnot. So how did he get appointed in the first place? You understand? It's a very dangerous thing. You get me? So mm -hmm. you don't panic that guy, but you try to find out, so who appointed him? You see, I think that we, we have a state which we must protect. But corruption is, in, is obviously a, a major issue for governance, and indeed, this particular administration was, was quite very, very heavy on corruption coming into, into power. From where you sit, and your assessment, indeed, of the structures, institutions, and indeed the government in power <coughs> to fight against corruption, how well are we doing? Yo, no. I mean, I mean, your question begins the answer. Excuse me, really? Why are we having the, the so-called scandals coming up and everybody's worried? That is the state of where we are, you understand? And I think, really, that the president of the republic, you know, must move one step up above everybody else and say, this is not the way we're going to go. You know, mm -hmm. officials of state are paid to work for the state, period. I heard the president loud and clear when he said that you are being appointed, when they were swearing the mean, mm -hmm. you're being appointed to do public work. If you want business, go into business. Mm -hmm. I, that was the day I gave a thumbs up to the president. I'm not seeing it in, in, on the ground. And I think that Mr. President must sit up, he must get up, and you must act a little more firmly. You got me? Because it, it's like I say, it's depressing to wake up every morning and it's happened, it's happened there, it's happened there. It may be, you may sound political, but the, the reality, PDS is a PDS. When you have the person or the entity that actually regulates procurement, caught up in the center of it, then all lost, uh, all, all hopes, how do you say? It's all hopes is lost. Right. You see, because that is the, the referee, mm. the person or the institution that must ensure that the rules and regulations pertaining to procurement are handled. They will need to clean up that institution. We need to be told, we need to be shown that that regulatory establishment, you know, has gotten or put this matter beyond it or behind it, and they are, they are up there, you know, mm. that we can trust. As I said, that these matters must be stopped before they happen. We must have some preventative uh, methods mm. for dealing with them, not say we have suspended the person and whatnot. You understand? You think suspension corruption is not enough? It's endemic corruption. We are not going to eliminate corruption uh, uh, today, tomorrow. We had corruption PNDC. We had corruption NDC. We had corruption whatnot. But what is happening today? We need hope for a stronger future. And, and you, you're not seeing that. I'm saying that Professor Aite, you know, mm -hmm. he has written some real, he set out some figures. It's frightening. The amount of money that we lose to corruption in Ghana and Africa, you know, can turn us into a first world country within five years. A lot more. Are action. you surprised that South Africa and, is happening? And, 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 uh, it's the same not. problem in South Africa, which they must deal with. True. And, 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 and less of words. Corruption. They say it's older than mankind. I don't know. But what Nana is saying is very, very true. Uh, all of us have been talking about corruption, corruption. We don't see the institutions working. Who do we blame? We're now saying the president must act. He can't act. He cannot. Why? He, no, because he doesn't have the right to act the way we want him to. I see the president should be the, the head of every institution to tackle corruption. No. The institutions of state are built to. He can give the direction. Because if he does that, then the democracy dies. He can give the direction. 
My beef is with the politicians. The institutions we are talking about who should make sure that X is done properly, PDS or PBS or whatever it is, KKK or whatever it is, the police, the military, who do we put where? And why? What is the remit of that institution? I've always said that mm -hmm. the police must work according, only according to the remit of the constitution given them. Every institution must work. NCC, they must work only according to what that, that institution is built to. But the politicians tell them what to, what to do. What happens is that they are always at the back and call of the politicians. Not and you are afraid. No, no, no. Not NCC, I, I believe. <laughs> but the point is that, but, Madam, you are very careful not to step on the toes of those powerful politicians. You are very careful. You, you walk a thin line. My beef is with the politicians. Maybe I have an acerbic tongue, so become a minister of something. Maybe I can insult the opposition better. So get a get a, a post. And, and, and as a matter of fact, that's why and you will probably will be directing it back to the president. Because in the, the end, you said the back stops with him. I'm talking about political patronage. patronage. And the Precisely. president the president is not everywhere. He is going to believe, wait a minute. He is going to believe that the police you that arresting somebody and prosecuting, why should the president come in? Why should the president come in? If you if you are doing it and doing it well, what are you afraid of? But because maybe the president put me there, I don't want to do it. That's what I'm talking about. Maybe maybe I I just, 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 just real point that you see the modern the democratic processes. One of the things that we talk about is um, um, accountable governance. Exactly. True. That accountable is is something that's been added exactly. of late. To the whole concept of democracy. Mm -hmm. Now, so that's why I said we must understand that a time will come when we'll be accountable. Look, if every political appointee were to know and to remember and to be told that one day he will account. And there's nothing that, like, that is you know, if the accountability structures exactly. do work. Because oh, sometimes it, you would have actually politicians over, it will get away with it work. because the structures actually don't work. If the yeah. structures are working, it then we would be able to it have will ultimately that certainty. Work. It will ultimately that work. Me, Maybe at a time when you will be weak or you cannot even defend yourself fully. That is when you are out of power. So do it now. No. It's in you. your interest. Right. You know, the, 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 the issue of, co of, of corruption is complex. So like we, we spoke about political patronage. So when you, look about, when you look at the big scandals that are going on, you find out that at behind the scenes, you have persons and personalities mm -hmm. who have funded campaigns, parties, their, their governments have come into power, or their parties have come into power, and they must be recompensed for Thank what you. they've spent. So the whole issue even of our democracy, built around elections, mm -hmm. everything begins and starts and ends with elections. Elections, you win elections, and you're immediately thinking, what do I do to stay in power, and what do I do to win the, the, the power you. again? So everything is geared at that. So anyone who is working in a particular position that has been appointed by some government is thinking, I have to contribute my quota to the party. Mm -hmm. So they'll bend over backwards, they'll break the law, mm -hmm. they'll indulge in corrupt practices mm -hmm. in order to fund parties. Mm -hmm. So the whole issue about political party funding even must it's, be it's, here. It's and then issue. the issue about the average Ghanaian. I spoke about young children who are beginning to think a certain way. Mm -hmm. We need to reconscientize ourselves. Because when we talk about the big politicians doing the big things, ask yourself, in your little corner, you haven't been able to resist that little temptation. So how do you think that when you go into a certain position, predisposed to bigger monies and you know, bigger deals, you won't, you won't fall prey? And then you are asking yourself also that as we are going forward as a country, we're talking about accountable governance, we're talking about um, all of these things. What are we ourselves doing as Ghanaians? If we can't control our, our own ourselves, how are we going forward? We can't just blame politicians. Mm. We must blame ourselves because we can't even stand, we can't even 
wait for the red light. We must jump a red light. So it's a collective it's fight. It's a collective fight. It is not but just... But how, how, how well are we doing, Madam Kumar, from where you start in a fight against corruption? I don't think we're doing well. I think there's a lot more we need to do. I mean, for instance, okay. our, 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 our grant for four years. I said, four years, what are we going to do? We will barely scratch the surface. Mm. You have to look at it from the youngest child to the oldest in individual. The way you are how, pointing to me as the youngest child. Yes. <laughs> and see how we can all play our part in the fight against corruption. I'll tell you for, for okay. a fact. Right. No, quickly. <coughs> I'm sitting, I came into public service in 2015. You had friends who have known you for years, known what you stand for, but they come to you and they say that, hey, where you are going? Shine your eye. Don't just go and sit there. So people who speak against corruption, behind you, your own friends are um, goading you on. You understand? So it's become, we are so desensitized. We need to get to the point where we, we see corruption as so repugnant mm. to our nature. And it's not going to take four years, it's not going to take five years. It's going to take a long time and it demands the effort of each and every one of Whole us. Generation. And of course, leadership is key. Leadership, leadership is, key. is key. You agree that we're not doing well in the fight against no, corruption? No, well, I agree. Mm. That's no, no, final word on this, 30 seconds. Clearly, your, 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 your assessment of this fight against corruption now. Yeah, I've told you that I, I, I think that we are retrogressing to the extent that we are even defending the, 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 the bad uh, steps. You understand? Mm -hmm. When you, you read official documents seeking to validate or clean up obviously bad situations, that's not helpful. You understand? Right. We must face it and say that if there are bad nuts, we take them out. It's, it's, look, people do what you inspect, not what you expect. So if you appoint people out there and then you just simply expect that they will do well, you know, or if you, or if you come and give a blanket and my people are incorruptible, we have Burkina Faso. This is a country of the incorruptibles. That is why it changed from Ivory Coast, uh, or upper water, sorry, okay. upper water to Burkina, sure. you know. But that hope, where is it? So I am saying that for me, I think that we are not doing fine at all. Mm. We need to do a lot more. Not only behind doors, but you must exhibit it. You see, we must name and shame. That is the only way we stop things. Otherwise, it's like if he who can okay. get it back into the party, you know, must be healed. I don't think it is right. Anna, thank you very much for your thoughts uh, this morning. And indeed, that, that will conclude our conversation on this. And to, to the extent that there are many who think that the very nature of our democracy actually encourages corruption. Because, I mean, if we are not even interested in how political parties fund their campaigns, you, they, they, they do fundraising, people donate. They are not for the Christmas. Obviously, they see it as an investment, which they hope to recoup some returns on uh, eventually when, when the, those parties come into power. So it's a conversation we must be having a broader scale. Nana Todadze is international politic political transition expert and executive coordinator of CDTGA, Chilas Ghana, uh, former chief of staff of the Republic of Ghana, joining us. Nana, as always, I thank you so much for your time this morning. Dr. Vladimir Entry Danso is international relations expert and the dean of academic affairs at the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College. I thank you so much, Doc, for your time this morning. Madam Josephine Nkroma is the chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education. NCC, Madam, as always, thank you. thank you for your time this morning. I'm going to go for this quick break. When I come back, we will settle out and also get into the PDS conversation and the matters arising. The MIDA report and the portions of the leaked report of the government investigations after 30 days to stay. Welcome back to Key Points here on TV3. We're live also on 3FM 92.7, also live on TV3, Ghana on Facebook, all across the world on 3news.com. Remember, we're very interactive as always, so share your thoughts with us as we go on on the show. The Republic of Ghana, represented by the Electricity Company of Ghana and uh, the Ministry of Finance and uh, the Power Distribution Services, PDS, signed the private sector participation transaction agreements on July 3, 2018. The transaction agreements consist of the lease and the assignment agreements as the LLA, LAA, the, the, the bulk supply agreement, BSA, and the government support agreement. Now, if you recall, Cabinet at its 35th meeting on June 14, 2018, considered and approved the transaction agreements. 
and recommended same to Parliament for consideration. Just to lay a little background to this conversation we're going to be having, this transaction agreement as executed had 45 conditions precedent that were supposed to be completed prior to the transfer date. Now, if you look at this, the conditions precedent number 24 and 31, which I'm going to read to you as we go into the conversation, require that PDS should furnish it to ECG an initial payment security in the form of either a demand guarantee or a letter of credit issued by a qualified bank against power purchases and lease payments. Now, according to findings by FTI, which is a consulting company uh, uh, from the United States, for MEDA, in fact, they were contracted by the Millennium Development Authority, due to difficulties with raising a bank guarantee and in the absence of tariffs set in accordance with the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, rate setting guidelines, Ghana approved PDS's request submitted and demand guarantees issued by an insurance company. And now we know, obviously, as always been the case, is done well. Among other things, the report by FTI Consulting as submitted to MIDA contained uh, conclusions. And I'll just read a few of the conclusions as I introduce my guest. One, the payment securities that were presented by Cal Bank and PDS to MIDA on February 27, 2019, which were subsequently accepted by the Ministry of Finance and ECG, are compliant with the recommendations contained in the URDG. And talk about the URDG, essentially the URDG is the Uniform Rules for Demand Guarantees uh, 758. Two, we have not seen any documents that would suggest that as of March 1, 2019, PDS, Carbank, Danwell, and or personnel from MEDA should have questioned the validity of the payment securities. We further note that officials from AI could confirm to K&L that the stamp applied on the acknowledgement and agreement page of the payment securities is that of AI and code. As a matter of fact, this particular reports that conclude that based on the review of all the documents, PDS, MIDA, and all other personnel of these two institutions did no wrong in this whole PDS scandal. Kujopoku is an Nigerian expert. He joins me in studio together with Kwame Jantua as well, who is an energy expert. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Right, good thank morning you, to you. How are you? I, I, I could have been better if all of this, you know, w was unpacked to, to, to the understanding of my grandmother, who only cares about having her lights on and ECG being a strategic asset of this country in safe hands. Yeah. What do we make of this particular report? Well, um, which of the reports? We, we so let's start off with the MEDA report. Because the the, FTI, I mean, the yes. FTI report. Okay. You see, most people are coming out to say that the FTI report contradicts the government report. It doesn't. If you look at, I've always asked that. I've always said that. If you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. If you add the right answers, then you get the right answers. The scope of work, which is attached to the report, the consultant were asked the uh, work that they were supposed to do they were given a scope of work to undertake, and they went according to the scope of work given. So if you look at their report, they gave the report according to the scope of work. They were to interview various people, the various players, how this thing all came about, how we ended at where we are. If you do not read the report in its entirety, you might make the wrong conclusion. Mm -hmm. One-liners are not good for a report. And yesterday, there was an attempt by the media or some people behind the scene to put this in the media and say that, look, PDS has been cleared. Mm -hmm. And some of us came up strongly and said, no, that's true. not true. Mm -hmm. Because the entire report brings more questions than answers. True. So if we look at the FTI report, what FTI seek to do was that, look, let's now do a forensic edit, chronicle the events. They spoke to the banks, how this whole thing started. They spoke to Downwell, they spoke to ECG, they spoke to even the CID, they spoke to MIDA, they spoke to PDS. So this report, really, if somebody reads part of it, is not doing justice, but it goes to show us how this thing started and how it came about. But let's not waste time and let's delve into this mm -hmm. thing. 
The basis of this guarantee, as you rightfully said in the introduction, in the lease agreement and the bulk purchase agreement, there are two agreements. PDS is supposed to put a lease payment guarantee for 100 million every quarter and $250 million for bulk purchase guarantee, which is $250 million every quarter. Mm -hmm. Both put together is $350 million every quarter. In the agreement that was signed, in section 5.11 of the agreement, the 5.11 tells you clearly what the payment security is supposed to be. What it says is that, look, every month, there is a certain payment that PDS is to make to ECG for the lease of the concession that they've been given. Then, at the end of every month, power that has been given to PDS to distribute, they should give a guarantee for that power that's been given to them. If at the end of the month, PDS is not able to pay ECG, who are the landlords, they are not able to pay them the lease. Ten days after the end of the month, the structure of the guarantee, which was put in place in the spirit of the agreement, was to say that ten days after the end of the month, if PDS has not paid any of the two monies to ECG, ECG just goes to a bank account which all authority has been given in the either the LC or the bank guarantee to just go and collect the money due them. Mm -hmm. After they have collected the money due them, 14 days after that, PDS is to replenish that account, okay, mm -hmm. so that their guarantee is put back in place. That is the fundamental operation of 511. That is the payment security. Now, in the Annex 2, and in the Schedule 2 and extent of, of the, the agreement, agreement, of the same agreement, it gives you a format of the wedding that the both letter of credit or guarantee, payment guarantee is supposed to be in. It is such that a bank issues it Whenever ECG needs to go and collect this money, they don't need to go to PDS. They go straight to the bank and make that withdrawal. Now, we've been told that there were problems with any bank issuing those guarantees to PDS. But let me tell Ghanaians, there are two fundamental reasons why. It is not because uh, the tariffs methodology and those things were not in place. It's not true. Look. If we well, are that, to, that, that's what the FTI report well, actually let me, indicated. That, that's what actually I'm pointed fingers. That's why. Seen. That's why I'm explaining. If you want us to increase tariffs to the level where you can do easy recoverables, then we would have left the concession with ECG, because the biggest problem ECG had ever complained for was not lack of manpower, lack of realistic tariffs. tariffs They've yeah. always said that they are not allowed to charge realistic tariffs. Mm. And government have said that, look, because of your old machinery, you are not able to reduce your losses from the 21% it is to acceptable levels of 8%. If we bring a company who is bringing enough money, if the company is bringing 500 million to invest in your machinery, he can reduce that losses from 21% to 8% so that you get more money. So we don't need to burden Ghanaians with more tariffs. So that issue, because look, the tariffs PDS is asking for, TPLC can never me and you will be overburdened. So let's not... Do you have an idea of, 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 the, of the tariff that... Tariff well, that PDS well has let me for? give you an example. Mm -hmm. In the tariff that we are paying now, mm -hmm. the lease payment, which is $100 million a quarter, PLC only factors in $56 million a quarter. So there is a differential of $46 million that is not factored into the... Uh, agreement in, into the PLC calculation. So if you want PLC to now factor in the full hundred million dollars a quarter, which is four hundred million dollars a year, Ghanaians will be overburdened. So it was it wasn't a straight jacket problem. And you guess what? During the conferences and the bidding process, PD, PDS and its miracle concession was aware of these things. Be it that they were given assurances that it will be reviewed or not reviewed, they were aware that there were challenges. So let's not sidetrack. Let's go forward. So now, when the issue came up that they are not able to raise the money, the reason that nobody would give PDS the money or the guarantee is in two folds. One, the shareholders of PDS does not have any balance sheet. They don't have any balance sheet. If you go to get a guarantee from a bank, you need to present you as a company. You need to present your balance sheet. 
and they then the have. bank can, then the bank will do a due diligence on the on the shareholders of PDS. Then, if the shareholding of PDS, the, their balance sheet is healthy, the bank can now give you the guarantee based on your the shareholders' balance sheet. In default of the shareholders not having a balance sheet, then the due diligence is done on the asset you are going to acquire, their balance sheet. So this is purely the due diligence being done on the balance sheet of ECG. So everybody looking at ECG will tell you ECG is not profitable. We know that. True. But the issue is that we needed a competent company who has money to come in and turn ECG around. Which PDS shareholders did not have. They don't have the financial balance sheet to be able to do this transaction. They have not been able. Look, they brought two letters in the bidding process. Two letters they brought, one from Standard Bank of South Africa and one from AFDB Bank. AFDB Bank and those letters are conditional. After they've been given a concession, and Standard Bank and AFDB Bank came and looked at the transaction, they said, look, based on the situation on the ground, we cannot support you. Because the due diligence, again, as I'm explaining, the due diligence is heavy on the balance sheet of ECG. Okay? So then, going forward from that, you realize that the government agreed that, okay, fine, no problem. If you cannot get a bank to issue you the guarantee, use... An insurance company and that we've seen in the report that the president the vice president the chief of staff everybody sat and agreed but there's a thought that ifc advised them to do that ifc did not advise them to do it in fact if you look at this report ifc was skeptical ifc said that look we are not confident that the insurance companies have analyzed pds credit and understand the risks they are assuming a demand guarantee from an unrated insurer introduces additional complexity, resulting in significant effort on due diligence and structuring. Mm -hmm. So IFC cautioned them. But they went ahead to now do the insurance. Because further, IFC now said that if the wedding is agreed on and is right and achieves what 511 wants to do, then yes, they can go ahead. But you see, but Mr. Jato, let me come to you. Because the, the part of the set government report, which is yet to be made official uh, but was leaked sometime last week said pds failed to provide demand guarantees for such an agreement and that enough financial guarantees for this deal was not also uh present which kojo has uh, made the point so really in the end these two reports are out the one who is watching us is asking and so what what do we do with this particular deal alfred Good morning to our viewers. Good morning to uh, Thank you. Uh, yourself. I believe that at the point when PDS approached MIDA and said to MIDA, we are having challenges acquiring a first class bank. So let's move and let's see whether we can use an insurance company. That was the point where everything should have stopped. That was the point where MIDA government should have said, this particular company does not have the clout to, to, pursue. to pursue. Now, Koseka said something about this initially. The collusion of uh, stakeholders. stakeholders of the ECG. ECG concession. Yes, yes concession. Yeah. They analyzed all the companies that had put their name forward to bid for this. Mm -hmm. That had Dr. Steve Mantia and the others. Dr. Steve Mantia, myself, uh, Kojo, uh, Richard Nyama, Richard Nyama uh, Kofi Bentil. You know, we actually, and Koseka had started working on this thing far back, especially when the unions were having challenges with government on the 20% local content. Yes where we went to the president and said it needs to be increased and it was increased to 51. So Koseka was a stakeholder in terms of making sure that the right things are done. Now, the moment PDS came and said we can't do it, it should have stopped. Government should have gone back to MCC and said to MCC, unfortunately, the company who have won this bid do not have the financial capacity to go ahead with it. So, let's renegotiate this MCC 500 million. The challenge we had at the time was that government was eager to access the 500 million. 
because the due date for the expiration of that 500 million was very close. Mm -hmm. As a result of this court As a action. court and the delays, delays. and all, exactly. was very close. So we threw caution to the wind and looked more at the 500 million than looking at the company that had put its name forward to run this thing. Because when you look at the reports and the terms of reference given to the team that went to uh, Qatar, if you permit me, Please. I'll read. It says, and this is from the leaked report, mm -hmm. it says, terms of reference, the following are the terms of reference for the delegation. One, a certain whether I could authorize the issuance of the guarantees on behalf of PDS and in favor of Electricity Company of Ghana, ECG. Two, ascertain whether I could issue the type of guarantee PDS presented to the government of Ghana. Three, establish whether I could ever issued any form of guarantee to ECG, and if so, on whose authority this was done. And then five, establish whether I could had a guarantee in place for ECG on March 1st, 2019. This was the terms of reference for the team. Now, let me tell you Alkut's answer. Key points made by Alkut. Alkut ascertained, ascertained, and I'm reading from the, the report, that the first time the matter of the purported issuance of demand guarantees as security for the LAA and the BSA came to its attention was when the company received the first letter from the Electricity Company of Ghana, ECG, dated 28th February. That was the first time I could hear. So, Danwell, Joe Australia, these were the two companies handling the insurance. We need to ask them. Don't forget Cowbank. And Cowbank, yes. Cowbank and Cowbank. Are, Cowbank yes. are the yes. Prime, yes. prime lead yes. insurance. Yes. Cowbank, let's Cowbank. not forget Cowbank. Yes, Cowbank. They made us understand that they had acquired a reinsurance company, Akut. Akut is saying they knew nothing about it till they received the letter from ECG. This was a surprise to the company mm -hmm. as it had no record of such a transaction. No, are we going on break? Y yes, okay. uh, but in, as a matter of fact, I need you to hold on to that because that is indeed a very, very instructive you know, uh, point that will complement all others that we've been talking about. And uh, right after this break, stay with us. Um, lawyer Kwame Jantua would get into that aspect of the report. You welcome back to Key Points here on TV3. We are live on 3FM 92.7 and on TV3 Ghana on Facebook. Lawyer Kwame Jantua is a private legal practitioner, also an energy expert. Join me in studio, Kujupoko as well, is an energy expert. We've been having a discussion on this. Before the break, Lawyer, you were talking about, in fact, you're going to give me the response of our quote yes. to uh, the, the questions that are captured in the, in the government leak report. Yes. What is it? So I gave you the first half of it where our quote indicated that on the lease assignment agreement in the book, supply agreement this was the first time they were hearing about it when ecg contacted them mm -hmm. they further go on to say that this was a surprise to the company as it had no record of such a transaction no application for such a facility had been received by the company from any entity neither had there been a delivery of any document regarding the laa or the psa to alcud mm -hmm. they thus set out to ascertain the facts surrounding the alleged insurance guarantees when they receive this. Now, the one thing that seems to be different from the FTI and the government report, in, in terms of the people they spoke to, FTI we spoke to, mm. and they've outlined that in the FTI report. And I'll quote, it says, these and this is key, these observations are based upon the information currently available to FTI. In this respect, it should be noted that as of the date of this final report, FTI has not been able to speak to Osman Hag Musa, Chief Officer of General Insurance, Alkut Insurance and Reinsurance Company, whose letter dated July 16, 2019, 
was a major factor in the commissioning of this investigation. So they didn't talk with this Musa guy. But when you come to, to the, the key the, points, the it is the Musa guy, the Musa, that gentleman, who is reporting, who set out the key points for our court. And he further goes on to say, <laughs> sad. He further goes on to say, Mr. Musa made inquiries of the officer of Al Qud whose signature appeared on the demand guarantees, Yaya Al Nuri. Al Nuri initially denied signing any guarantees and promised to resolve it with the broker Joe Australia. You can see the way things are meandering in. He goes on to say, when asked about a letter dated 13th March 2019, it purported reply to the ECG letter of 28th February, mm -hmm. I could ascertain that that same was a fabrication and part of the fraud perpetrated by the proponents of the demand guarantee. Who are those proponents? It could be Calbank, could be Danwell, it could be PDS themselves. No, Joe Australia. No, Joe, Australia. Joe Australia. Joe Australia. Yes, Joe is Australia. part of it. The alleged signatory Mr. Musa denied being the author of that letter. He claimed that this signature was not forged by Yaya Al Nuri and that his signature is palpably different from what appears on that letter. And, and the good thing is that this is what the government team has ascertained from our court. The one thing that I had expected the government team to also do was to go to Jordan and interview Joe Australia. Mm -hmm. Because in all these communications, Joe Australia, Joe Australia seems is, is, silent. Is, is, is a okay, key. No, he's, a not, key. He's, key. he's not. He's here. Joe Australia no, is captured heavily wait, wait, in the, wait, in the wait, FTI wait, report, yes, so but not in wait, the government wait, wait, report. Wait. Yes. Mm -hmm. For me, the government report is key for me. Well, that's fine. But you see, it's the government key, report... It's key for me. Could you let me finish? Uh -huh. The okay. government report is key for me. The challenge we have now is that MCC and MIDA are sticking to their report. Mm -hmm. Government, I'm sure, they haven't said anything, but will stick to their report. The only thing running through the two reports is Al-Nuri. So, who do we, the public, believe? Both. Both. And government? Let me set it out. FTI. Let me set it out. It's both. Okay, you, both reports say the same thing. Let me set it out, okay? Look, Joe Australia is an insurance broker. Downwell partners Joe Australia. Mm -hmm. Downwell takes business, only insures 5% as per the NIC law locally, and takes the 95% out for reinsurance. They give it to Joe Australia, who is the broker. Joe Australia now plays that insurance with various reinsurance companies across the world. In this case, Joe Australia clearly states that Joe Australia is saying that our court was not to reinsure the risk. He says that. He says that. Listen, let me read. He says that. Look, our court FTI in report. FTI report. Yes, Joe Australia noted that they broker various types of reinsurance coverage with our court, including but not limited to those relating to trade risk and demand guarantee. Joe Australia, however, noted in past. Trade-related transactions were done on a full retro basis, meaning that our court will take on the credit rates, but would effectively retrocede 100% of the risk for a 10% fronting fee. Process that would allow for the risk not to reflect in our court's net account. But that is well, not right. Exactly. Well, that's, exactly. That's exactly. So that you see, that is the fraud is being fraudulent. perpetrated by Joe Australia. Yes, okay. And he clearly states it. Yeah. He, he's not hiding it. And that is he why, even and goes and on to say that. And that is why I say gentlemen, the government should have gone to you Jordan see, let me to read, interview let me, Joe Australia let me, too. Let me read again. Joe Australia noted that this was a premium to be paid to final barriers of the risk. In insurance, the only time an insurance is insured is when a premium is paid. Mm -hmm. So as far as what our court is saying, they're 100% right. They have not been paid any premium, premium, so they do not have any risk. They've not covered any risk. What the Yaya and Nuri did is that he works for our court. He runs a gig with Joe Australia. 
So when Joe Australia needs a cover note, they go to Al Nuri, who on the side collects that 10% and gives a cover note. But bear in mind, the bank, that's why the government is saying it's a fraud. Mm -hmm. It's a fraud because we all know that Downwell does not have the capacity to ensure a 350 million guarantee. So Downwell is the prime insurer. But his cover, the person who is giving him the bone, the, the spine, is Alkut. But only Alkut cover note. So the conspiracy was that. And let's not forget Cal Bank. Cal Bank played a very major role in all this. In the government report mm -hmm. signed by the Interior Minister, it indicts Cal Bank and, and, Deputy, Attorney and, Donwell, and Deputy Attorney General. It indicts Cal Bank for fraud. It indicts Donwell for fraud. So I'm expecting that Bank of Ghana will investigate Cal Bank for fraud. NIC, National Insurance Commission, will investigate um, Donwell for and fraud. And this is clearly captured, clearly in, captured the in the report, report. government report, where they have done other transactions with the same process, where Al Nuri gives because from what the government report says that quickly mm -hmm. when they went through the emails of al nuri after he's been suspended they found out that it's something he's been doing so they've done even the terminal the container terminal in takradi that's the same process they used so whoever gave money to cow bank to ensure that based on the guarantee procured by joe australia it is said in this report that it's a fraud the, this you refer to this particular arrangement. Uh, the, arrangement the arrangement raised. is fraudulent. Okay, the arrangement for now everybody should ask themselves why did Cow Bank take five point two million dollars just to be advised? It's not right. You cannot be doing this if you don't know the motive behind it. So they and Donwell had a way of raising these fictitious guarantees from our court. Not our court as a company. But a principal of Alkut in the name of Yaya Anuri, who connives with Joe Australia to give, because it's clearly stated, he says that, look, Joe Australia noted that this was a premium to be paid as a final bear of the risk. The retoshineers and Alkut was only entitled to 10% fee, not entitled to premium given they had requested 100%. They were only supposed to collect 10% for what? Fronting fee, clearly stated in the report. So Alkut did not give a guarantee of 350 million. That is the basis of all this. So when people come and say that, oh, where is the fraud? Nobody is, uh, the, the fraud is that there is no guarantee with government. What Downwell gave, Downwell doesn't have 350 million dollars. We know that. Downwell's backbone, his backer, is supposed to be output. Output is saying that what I gave you, even what my guy who conspired gave you, is only a cover note. The company whose balance sheet is $170 million cannot insure a $350 million transaction. What we should notice very strangely is that Joe Australia now managed to now come to Ghana and give 15% of the risk to a company called Best Assurance Company, which is quite strange. <laughs> so it tells you that there was a gig going on, and the government found out about the gig. That is why this whole thing is suspended. Now, it's interesting because earlier there was this reaction that, that government disagreed with portions of this FTI report. But there's clearly some, some major similarities in the number of conclusions that they have yes, made. Yes, definitely. So the, in the end, what do we do? Because the whole thing from what you, you, you have pointed out clearly begs for a lot of questions. Should this particular deal be abrogated, or what does this particular you know aspect of the government report exonerating PDS mean? Alfred, before I even come to that, let me add something where it would show the fraud element. Mm -hmm. Joe Australia, uh, 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 Joe Australia, and Danwell should have known that according to the government's report mm. that the guarantees had the value of about 350 million our could does not have the capacity to engage such a transaction the company's net worth was about 170 million if they've been doing business with our could they should have known this and not even approach our could for this 350 million guarantee at all <laughs> and that confirms what Kujo is saying, saying that it is a gig they've been running 
all along. Now, I would prefer that we abrogate the contract. We should abrogate the contract? Yes, we should abrogate the contract. Because there are pockets of fraud in the whole value chain. Perhaps, perhaps, if we're not going to abrogate the contract, then the entire deal should be investigated. Right from the word go to the yes. end, including the 51% local content shares in there. Let's have an independent body go through the whole thing, and then after that, we now sit and see how we can put this thing right. Yes, it means that where ECG is concerned, they probably government will probably have to leave them to stick to what they are doing now in handling the distribution uh, of electricity to, to us till such time that we've come to the end of this and know exactly what direction we should take. See, could you, Alfred, finally, the would law, you go on the same time? The supports what my brother Mr. Yantua is saying. Let me tell you what 3.2L of the agreement reads. Finally. Failure of the company to deliver and maintain the lease payment security in accordance with Section 511 constitutes a termination of the agreement. So it is in there. It is yeah. in there, clearly. In failure to maintain and deliver. So not only do you deliver, failure to maintain it. So let's even assume it was delivered. It has not been maintained because it's found out not to be what it's supposed to be. Now, let's quickly go into an area where we think that we should be careful for government. Government should not rush into this transaction to put it back because there were problems before the Alkut thing came and government was trying to quietly resolve that. Now they should halt, regroup, and let's look at it in the long term. If not, we kick the can down the road, five years down the line, this thing will fall apart. We're talking about 22.4 billion CDs of it's assets. It certainly uh, uh, has a lot of uh, questions on it that needs to be answered. And then the analysis we've been doing basically has been on this FTI report and the government commission investigation report that was leaked sometime last week. Gentlemen, as always, I thank you so much for your time. Thank you uh, for having this us. morning. Uh, Kujo Poku is an energy expert joining me in studio. Lawyer Kwame Jantua is also a private legal practitioner and an energy expert as well. And they have been at this PDS deal from the get-go. And that's why they have a lot of authority and, and passionate about this to speak about this particular issue. Thank you, gentlemen, and as well for your time this morning. And for you, the viewers as well, we're extremely grateful that you stayed with us. On behalf of the rest of the team here on Key Points, my name is Alfred Okansi. Do enjoy the rest of our programs. Good morning.